Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Isaiah chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every, every warrior's boot used in battle. And every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And all God's people said, Amen. Over the past couple weeks, we've talked about just about every character that there is within this Christmas story. We've talked about Elizabeth and Zechariah. We've talked about the birth of John the Baptist. We've talked about Mary and Joseph. Last week we talked about the shepherds. And we learned throughout this series of the different faith lessons that we can derive from each of them. And as I came to this week, I honestly went, all right, Lord, what am I going to talk about this week? And he goes, well, you, you kind of forgot about the main guy right? You kind of forgot about Jesus and, and the faith lessons that we learn from Jesus in this story. But before you laugh at me too much, uh, have, don't we all tend to forget about the main guy, especially in the hustle and bustle of the Christmas season and all the gifts and all the parties and all, all the music, we lose sight of the miracle of what really transpired that night. We lose sight of the awe and the majesty of the fact that we have a God who's so great, who created the world with just his words, created all the universe and the stars, 
And as Frederick Buechner said, he humbled himself to be a baby and to wear diapers. He humbled himself so low to take on all of our human condition, wrapped in our human DNA, our human flesh. He was not just God, but he is the God-man, fully God and fully man. And we lose sight of how miraculous the incarnation is because, you know, after all, we talk about it, we sing about it, we have a nativity scene, but we lose sight of what it means that God became one of us. As C.S. Lewis said, God became one of the sons of men so that we could become the children of God. And so I thought about some of our traditions. I asked this of some people the other day, you know, why do we do certain things? Why do we light a Christmas tree? Why do we put up a Christmas tree? And very few people could actually ever give me the answer of why we put up a Christmas tree. Uh, we put up a Christmas tree because that's what you do at Christmas time. And yesterday, I spent four hours wrapping Christmas presents. How many of you love wrapping? And I'm talking about presents, not wrapping music, okay? <laughs> but not many of you raised your hands. How many of you love getting a wrapped present? See, I love getting a wrapped present but I don't like rapping. And in fact, as I'm rapping yesterday, I said, boy, I wish I paid attention to geometry class because you know, you gotta have the right angle with the rapping. And, but at least now they put grid lines on the rapping. But it took me four hours only to wrap maybe about 15 presents, 20 presents, and I went, why on earth do we wrap presents? Like who came up with this idea? And then I thought about it, I went, well, God came up with the idea of wrapping presents because the idea of a present is that there's a mystery inside of it, right? It's right. The whole idea of Christmas and, and Christmas morning, remember, it's the anticipation of what is going to be under that tree. And then when you see the tree, what is going to be inside of that present? It's all about the anticipation and the excitement, right? I mean, it's, it's all that build up leading up to it. And in fact, that's what Jesus is. He is that wrapped present beneath the tree, waiting for all of us to unwrap it, to see what he is all about. As the Bible says, to taste and see that the Lord is good. What a shame it is that many of us never actually unwrap that present. We look at the present and we've heard about the present, but we don't unwrap the present. But let's think about this for a moment, why it is that God had to become flesh, that God became a baby. Because after all, Jesus, if he did have to come in the flesh, he could have come as a conquering king. He could have been born to nobility rather than in this scandalous way of a virgin Mary and Joseph who are pledged to be married, and then there's no room for them in, their, in the inn, and they're in a manger stall. This is not a way that God, that you would think that God would become man. But why is this so? Well, Soren Kierkegaard, and by the way, last week when I talked about the Duck Village, he's the guy that talked about the story. Uh, not that many of you remembered even that I brought that up. Uh, it's always a humbling thing when I say to people, uh, how'd you like the sermon? I love the sermon, Pastor, and what did I talk about? And then they don't know what to say. So, um, but Soren Kierkegaard talks about this idea of a prince that falls in love with a peasant girl. And he falls in love with her in her ordinariness, and, but he recognizes that if he comes to her as a prince, decorated as a prince, adorned as a prince, then the girl would probably want to marry him, but not marry him because she's in love with him, but marry him because he's the prince. And all the things, and in awe of all the things that a prince would have with it. And so what does the, king, the prince do is he decides to set aside his royal garments and he takes on the clothes of a peasant. And he lives among the peasants and he visits her every day in the marketplace to woo her over with his love. Till one day she declares that she is in love with him and he reveals to her that he is a prince 
and they live happily ever after. But think about this. Soren Kierkegaard uses this story to illustrate the incarnation. Why God became flesh in the way that he did. He became flesh in the way that he did so that we wouldn't fall in love with him for what he could do for us and all his power and that we would be forced to follow him, but that we would choose to follow him because he, we would spend time with him because God became one of us. And that is the miracle of Christmas. The, it's the miracle of the incarnation. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, this is what it says in the message translation. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privilege of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Think about that. Jesus sets aside his deity. As it says in this passage in the New International Version, he was equal with God. He, he had status, equal status with God, but he chooses to lay aside all of those privileges to be born in that manger. Why would he do that? Well, he does that because of what it tells us in 1 John chapter 4. God is love. And how does God demonstrate his love? By sending his son so that we would experience life. He wanted, but life isn't something that you just get. Life is something that you experience. And so that's why we have Jesus who experienced life with us. So that we would not be alienated from God and that God is some kind of cosmic dictator telling us commandments and telling us what to do, but rather God is that wonderful counselor that it tells us in Isaiah, the counselor who's the great coach of life, the great coach who doesn't yell at us but comes alongside us. That's what's amazing about Jesus, and I have to tell you, that's why I get excited about Jesus. Somebody asked me not that long ago, how do you know what to preach every Sunday? And I go, well, I pretty much preach the same thing. I preach about God's love. And, and they go, do you ever get tired of it? And I said, there's a lot of things about being a pastor I get tired of. Like, I get tired of people complaining. I get tired of building problems. I get tired of this stuff. But I never get tired of talking about the love of Jesus. Because the love of Jesus is so great that how could there ever be enough sermons to talk about the love of Jesus? And most people might intellectually affirm that Jesus loves them. I mean, they'll, they'll sing the song, Jesus loves them, but they don't get it from deep within that Jesus loves them. And the reason that I know that they don't get it from deep within that Jesus loves them is because our lives would be dramatically different if we got a hold of that revelation. I mean, we would be bold and we would be willing to step out and take chances and we wouldn't let anything hold us back. We would seek out Jesus wherever he is. We would seek him out in the poor. We would seek him out in the oppressed. We would seek him out in our jobs. We would seek him out in our churches. Every person that annoys us, we would seek Jesus in that person because we would be filled with the love of God because that's what happens when you start getting to know about God's love. When you start getting to know about God's love, well, it's kind of like a cookie. A lot of you have been giving me cookies. And I feel those cookies around me. And I feel them bursting out of me. Especially when I put my belt on today. And I went, ooh, I got to go back one. But that's kind of like what it is. You get filled with that sweet stuff and you begin to expand, don't you? Now we don't like expanding our waist, but we could all begin expanding our spiritual waistlines, getting filled with the love of Jesus, not so that we would be fat, lazy Christians, but so that we would be active Christians and share that love with the world around us. 
So in Isaiah, we get four characteristics, four traits of, of Jesus, and I just want to highlight those for us today. The first one is that he is a wonderful counselor. Now, in some translations, wonderful stands alone, that it's wonderful, comma, counselor. But in other translations, they combine it here. But think about it this way. He is, when we talk about a counselor, now this is how we think about a counselor. We think about a counselor as somebody that we pay to talk about all of our problems to. Isn't that what we think about? But that is not what the biblical version of a counselor is. A counselor here is someone who gives you counsel, who gives you advice. And he's not just any any teacher, but as Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, that he gives us words and that these words have the power of life in them. His words bring life. The thief comes in John chapter 10, 10. Jesus says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so that you would have life and life more abundant. And so the teachings of Jesus bring about true life and they are wonderful because they're unlike anything that the rest of the world would have you come to know. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, this is what we read. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus was the word that became flesh. God who became flesh so that he would understand what we go through so that we, he would understand all those problems. So many people are hesitant to go to God with their sins and with their problems. We're all like Adam and Eve and we're trying to hide in the garden as if you can ever hide from God. But God knows us. It says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. He knows every hair on our head and even those that are falling out, he knows where they fell out. And yet, and so we are able to approach God's throne with confidence, knowing. I mean, think about it. how awesome is that? Wonderful counselor. How awesome is that? That because of Jesus, we get to go to Him, go to God whenever, with whatever is going on, and you are not going to surprise God. Yeah, thank you, Angela. Somebody's excited about it. The second thing that we see within that Isaiah 9 passage is that Jesus is mighty God. In Matthew 1, 21, we read, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. I want us to emphasize that word, save. There is nothing in all of creation that can separate you and I from the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. And that when, our, when we approach times of weakness, that's when his strength is made perfect within us. Jesus came to save us because we cannot save ourselves. How many of us know we can't get out of our own way half of the time? So that's why we have been given a savior. For unto us a child is born. Unto us we have been given the Word made flesh. In the word in Hebrew for mighty God, almighty God, is El Shaddai. He is almighty. There is no situation that is too impossible for him. What Jesus tells us is that what is impossible for man is possible with God. And now we say that, but do we live as though we believe that? Because if we believe that his love is in us and that he abides with us, Jesus says, all you got to do, abide in me and I will abide in you and you will produce great fruit. That's all you got to do. Stick with me. Why? Because I'm the mighty God. I'm the source of your strength. And because of that, we should be able to pray big prayers, dream big things, do mighty things because we serve a mighty God. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. God is able to do more than we could ever begin to ask or imagine. But do our prayers reflect that? 
Do our lives reflect that? How about this? Sometimes we don't know what to, how to pray, right? Anybody there with me? Don't know what to say, don't know how to pray. You know, the disciples didn't know how to pray, and what they said to Jesus, they go, Lord, teach us to pray. I think that should be the beginning of every prayer. Lord, teach me to pray. Lord, teach me to pray for big things and small things and all the things in between. Because how many times do we miss out on mighty God in our midst? Jesus is also the everlasting Father. In John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you want to know what God is like, go to the red stuff. That's what I tell everybody all the time. Go to the red stuff, read the red stuff, and then you'll understand the black and white stuff. But until you understand the red stuff, you'll never understand the black and white stuff in the light that it was intended because Jesus is the Word made flesh. God dwelling among us. In Matthew 1, 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. God isn't just dwelling among us, but think about it. God is with us. And God is not just with you and I. Everybody, I want you to say, God is with me. Say, God is with me. Because again, you got to remind yourself, God is with you. Now I want you to say, God is for me. That's an important thing to understand that God is not against you. That there is nothing that you can do to make it so that God is going to oppose you. You may oppose God, but God is always coming after us. Because here's the other, that word everlasting. It appears also within the Bible in this, that he has loved us with an everlasting love. And everlasting love means before all time and after all time, it never stops. So he is always our father. He's a good father. And Jesus is the representation of that father. A father who provides for all of our needs. And what it tells us in the book of Romans that if God is for us, who can be against us? If he did not spare his only son, how much more will he give us all things? We get to share in this inheritance because Jesus is the everlasting Father. You know, the other thing about Father is that, that we need to understand from the Hebrew of this scripture is that Father is intended kind of in this same manner that George Washington is the father of this country. We refer to George Washington as the father of the country, but he started it, but we all are part of it. He's the head of it, but we're all part of it. Jesus starts a movement of the kingdom. And it tells us that, so it began as a little baby. And then it spread to the disciples. And then it spread to other people. And then it became this big movement. But the kingdom of God is not about bricks and mortar. It's not about the church buildings because we're the church, we are the body of Christ, the people of God are the body of Christ, and that movement continues. Jesus Christ is the Father, everlasting Father of the kingdom that knows no end. It continues on and it grows like that mustard seed. You might not know where it's going to sprout up, but it's going to pop up, and when it pops up, it's going to be a mighty tree. And all the forces of hell might come against it, but it will still prevail. And we have to understand this idea of the kingdom starting off small and growing in relation to this context in Isaiah when we look at that Jesus is our prince of peace. Because here's what in Isaiah 9-7, I got to tell you, growing up in church, I never understood what this statement meant. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now, what I didn't understand is this word government. Why is government thrown in there? I mean, because we think about government, you know, they're shut down. So, you know, good. There you go. But 
we think of government in terms of bricks and mortar, in terms of laws and legislation, but what the writer is saying here is of the great the more that Jesus expands in our life, the more his kingdom expands in our life, the more peace we're going to have. So the more Jesus you got, the more peace you get. How many of us recognize that many times we don't have peace in our lives because we're always fighting against God? We fight against God. Now, God is always willing to wrestle with us just as he would wrestle with Jacob. But wouldn't it be nice to use our energy for something different? And rather, we would submit ourselves to God's kingdom, to God's reign in our life. And here's what the effect is. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, Paul tells us, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So if we want to have the gifts of righteousness and peace and joy, what do we have to do? We have to allow God's reign to take hold of our lives. And what is this peace? Philippians 4, 7. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. No matter what situation we go through, we know that we don't go through it alone and there will be lousy situations and there will be situations that will not resolve themselves in the way that we think that they should be resolved. But that's what it means when it says the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Let me put it in another, word, in another way. Everybody around you would think you're crazy, but you still got peace. They think you're nuts for being in peace. That's the peace that surpasses all understanding. I remember Wilma, I'm sorry I'm telling a story, but Wilma had a cancer scare early on when I, when I was at the church. And I remember her being in the hospital bed and I said, Wilma, how are you feeling about it? And she goes, well, pastor. Actually, she calls me Reverend Father, most holy Reverend Father. <laughs> well, most holy Reverend Father, I think I get what that peace that transcends all understanding is all about because I'm not afraid. My friends, the more we allow Christ to expand his kingdom in our lives, the more we don't have to be afraid. And isn't that one of the messages of Christmas that we've learned over the past couple weeks? Do not be afraid. So my friends, today I want to just tell you, you have a Christmas present. Whether you're like me, when I wake up on Christmas morning, I come downstairs, Santa didn't come. And sometimes I sit there and I go, well, this is a little depressing. There's no presence there. So then I thought about hiring somebody to come in in the middle of the night <laughs> to put some presence down there. Then I thought about giving one of you the key and saying, come on in. But then I thought Marlene would bribe you and get the key from you. <laughs> that just wouldn't turn into a good situation. At least for me, Marlene might have a good time there. But, but you know what? The thing is, to us, a son is given. We've all been given this gift. And isn't it time that we unwrap it? And the thing about this gift is that when it says that his mercies are new every morning, is that it gets to be unwrapped every morning. Every morning there's a gift waiting for us to unwrap, to understand, to walk with. We are never alone. We are never separated from God's love. You are complete in him. Say that. I am complete in him. You don't need anything else but that present. For to us a child is given. A child is born. To us a son is given. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful gift wrapped in this tiny baby. We thank you, Father, that this baby became a man and became a servant to us all, died for us all as he was a sacrifice for us all. We thank you, Father, that he lives now for us all, and we all get to live in him. I pray, Father, for each and every one of us that during these Christmas days, that we would recognize that the Word became flesh 
and may, continues to make his dwelling among us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really?